Okay, welcome to another uh, podcast. And I am thrilled to have Tommy Thacker join me today. You do not want to miss this podcast. This is this is really special. I uh, I have goosebumps, and I just I've I just can't even say enough good things about Tommy. You've been so kind to me over the years, and the first time we met, I think it must have been two thousand eight or nine, and it's got to be around when you were just starting or something at FN and you were at SHOT Show and you were one of the pro shooters um, that was at the booth signing autographs. And I, I was humbled and I asked for an autograph for my granddaughter. I was so in awe (laughs) and I can't believe it. We've known each other so long and I've seen you, I've seen you grow and mature as a career in a career, but as a man and, and just been privileged to be a part of your journey because your journeys as humans aren't, they aren't simple and straight. They jig and jag and we have families and parents and children and spouses and ex spouses. And it's just a privilege and I'm so proud of you is that the risk of sounding like your mother, I don't want to age myself any farther than I need to, but thank you for this. No, thank, you. thank you so much for, for having me on and uh, for the kind words. And, and you're right. You know, our relationship does go back uh, quite a ways. And, and I remember that first introduction and uh, in the early days, uh, yeah, I was, I was at FN uh, as a uh, product manager and, and quickly the director of product management and uh, really learning the in-depth side of the industry because I hadn't been yeah. technically in the industry much longer than that, even though I had uh, a humble start as uh, a general manager to gun shop. So I did spend 13 years in the retail business. Um, and, and during those 13 years in the in the business, it was I was directly connected to some companies. I did some skunk work projects with Smith & Wesson and HK in the days. And uh, being in the Northern Virginia area, I was connected to some of those companies that had bases just outside of D.C. So that uh, that led to a lot of the early personal relationships that I have in the industry, along with the the first introduction to um, FN came through my shop and I did some work for them. And that led to what was the the next uh, big step in my career. So it was huge. It was huge. But I remember you know, you and your pro shooter career. I mean, you know, if we were only that young again, huh? I bet you can almost move as fast as you used to. Yeah, I would say that I'm probably in, in fairly decent shape right now and paying attention to that. Uh, so I'm, I'm probably still as quick on my feet. Uh, eyes eyes are almost there. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it, it has been uh, four or five years since I've been out to a major match, but I have that itch again and I'm in a spot yeah. where I think that I can probably uh, work that out in this next coming year in 24. I plan to hit a few matches. So it'd be nice Good. to uh, to get back out and see that. Tell us a little bit about the world of a pro shooter. Tell me about were you, you know, younger when you got into this? Were you, you know, like in 4-H shooting? I've never asked you. How did, how did you get to, because that, that was pretty early on. Like, it wasn't as nearly as established as it is now. Exactly. You know, I, I think that what most people don't realize, my first foray in professional shooting wasn't in the, uh, the action shooting world. So when I was out of school, I got into archery. And uh, I, I did some indoor uh, archery matches and then went to outdoor and did some NFAA matches and then quickly progressed into the 3D world. So I was a, a professional sponsored shooter by Oneida Bows. Wow, and, uh, I didn't traveled, know that. Traveled the ASA circuit for a few years and realized that that was more like work than it was fun at that point. And I was very young. I had some young children and it really wasn't what I wanted at that time. So uh, I did have that experience. And then being at the gun shop quickly progressed into, you know, seeing some of my idols at the time on TV shooting and then going to shot show and meeting them for the first time. And, you know, had that naivety of, I can do that, you know? And what I didn't know was that, man, these, these guys had already spent 20 years perfecting their skills and I was brand new to it. So you know, having the athleticism that I did, I just kind of went to the range and started mimicking what I saw them doing. So I didn't know any different. You know, my first experience was uh, at the NRA range indoor and 
just outside of DC. And I'm drawing from the cheapest holster I had, which was probably a, a Kydex Uncle Mike's or something. And I didn't have any mag pouches. So I'm doing reloads out of my pocket because I don't know any better. I'm just, yeah. I saw these guys doing it. So I need wow. to shoot and reload. Yeah. And uh, a couple, a couple of gentlemen approached me and asked me what I was doing. And I thought I was in trouble. And uh, oh, they, said, wow. they said, no, you're, you're actually seem like you know what you're doing, but we want to know more about you. And and they were some of the guys that were very influential in USPSA shooting action sports in the area. No way. And uh, they just said, you should probably do something with this. And uh, I went to a local match with them and realized that the NRA had indoor matches and boy, I needed a lot of gear and quickly got hooked on the sport. And, um, you know, Greg Wodak was running the NRA range at the time. And he gave me the nickname Tommy gun because I was pretty fast on the trigger. And, That's great. Uh, you know, I was just a sloppy mess. I was a bull in a china cabinet. You know, it was, it was course of the fire, which was a lot of fun and running around. And I knocked over more of his props and tore up more of his range than anybody else because I just wanted to go fast. You know, that's yeah. what I saw the guys doing. So I mimicked some of the best in the sport, which these guys have become great friends of mine over the years, you know, and Jerry Michelak, Rob Latham, Todd Jarrett, you know, those, those were all. Just, of. Don't you just want to pinch yourself and go, how? How did this become my life? Absolutely. You know, oh. it is, I look back over it and it's, you know, it's, it all started with, you know, humble beginnings of someone who didn't know any better. It's like, I can do that, you know, because Thank God for that, Thank I God we it. can't see the future. That's right. You know, and, and that was it. God blessed me with some abilities to, to do things and to learn things by, you know, I'm more of a visual learner. So I just watched and, uh, yeah. you know, being able to, to get in the, the small circle of the shooting world as quickly as I did certainly blessed. And it was uh, really a launching pad for my career. You know, I went yeah. from, from just a, um, I was managing a gun shop and one of the largest gun shops in North Virginia to being the lead uh, product guy at FN for the commercial and law enforcement market. And it was my expertise from being an expert user and connected to the commercial world that, catapulted me to that position. And, um, you know, those early years at FN, it was learning the corporate world of the firearms industry. It wasn't always, wasn't always a smooth journal journey. I not mean, at all. and this is not uncommon, you know, I mean, I think people should give themselves grace because we don't learn how to work in the corporate world until we've been in it. It doesn't matter how much education you have. It's learning how to deal with conflict and challenge and solving problems. You're exactly right. You know, for me, it was uh, I was my interactions were on a retail basis. So I had to inter interact with customers coming in. When I got to the corporate world, uh, your sh your shareholders and stakeholders are totally different. You know, it was yeah. I was the the voice between the customer and the engineering team of how do I get this product to market? And that took many years for me to to really understand that that was my role. Um, I knew how to use the product and I knew why it was working and why it wasn't. But the engineers on paper, they could design it and say, this is perfect. Yeah, but I had to uh, use some um, tactful ways to get the engineering team to understand what yeah. the product really does and yeah. why the design wasn't exactly right. So spending a lot of hours on the, on the range with engineering teams and testing and development uh, really helped curb my um, emotional intelligence for engineers and uh, for the corporate world, because what people don't realize is, you know, consumers want a product, companies want to make the product, but they also want to be profitable with that product because that's yeah. business. You know, we're not yeah. in, in business to not make money. So yeah, that exactly. was the hardest part to, to bridge that gap. Yeah, so you can take a passion like pro shooting, any kind of shooting sport, and you can turn it into a career, but you have to know along the way that just because you know your product inside and out and you can take apart that that product and know how it works doesn't mean that's going to carry you all the way into the corporate world. You have to be ready to realize that, oh, this might be a little humbling, and I'm going to be brave and not not give up because you you did a great job. I mean, I think you were at FN four or five years. Yeah, I was five years with FN. And, you know, being in the, the, the director of product management, I touched 
all phases of the business. So uh, during the FN years, you know, we built the shooting team, which was super exciting. Uh, it was in the early years of Three Gun really taking off that next level. Three Gun Nation, the TV show uh, that was yeah. uh, uh, Ken Fowle and myself really spearheaded that thing, got it off the ground uh, with with Pete and Chad at Three Gun Nation. And, you know, we took Three Gun from, you know, a, a backwoods, backwoods um, fun thing that people didn't know enough about to mainstream media and almost yeah. got a primetime spot on NBC before some things kind of turned sour. But you know, when I won the championship in 2012, um, my check actually came from NBC Sports and Leupold. So two different checks. So I actually got a check from NBC Sports from the network. So uh, it was an amazing time uh, for for me as a shooter to see where that sport had gone in a short amount of time. And, you know, almost three years, it went from, you know, obscure backwoods match at, you know, kind of a outlaw type deal to yeah. mainstream media on TV and, and people really knew what it was. And, you know, the, the growth of the sport was enormous in a short amount of time. So I think that was happening right underneath our feet. We didn't realize what we were doing for the sport, for the industry, you know, yeah. to have the, the championship at Vegas during shot show and, you know, all of the industry heads were at that event because it was exciting. It was something that hadn't been done before, you know, to have a live, live shootout, right there on the range in Vegas that everybody could attend. There was, that was probably the pinnacle of, uh, of the shooting sports for me. And, uh, well, you know, I had no idea at the time, you know, I hear I was among heroes and had no idea. And, you know, we've got to get Ken Fowl on. I just talked to him the other day and Mark Hanish. And I mean, that crew that you guys put together that Paul Parrott, right. All that yeah. crew at, uh, FN, you know, those are some really successful people. Everybody has gone their way yeah. and for the most part, really successful on their own. But it starts with a good crew. You know, it, it starts with supporting each other. And think of what what was fostered and grown there during uh, that time. Absolutely. You know, Shaley, you, you, you say it you know, right there. It's 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 teamwork and from the shooting sports, it was the shooting sports, an individual sport, but we treated it as a team, you know, so the yeah. six seven people we had on the team, our goal was to make sure everyone succeeded. And uh, for those that know me at a match back in those days, you know, I had the truck and trailer, you know, I was the product guy. I had three, four sets of everything because I wanted to make sure our team always succeeded. And sometimes uh, in, in the midst of things, something didn't go right with an individual on the range. Yeah. You know, I had loaner guns. I don't care who they shot for. Remington, Benelli, it didn't matter to me. If your shotgun went down, here's here's one of ours. Use yeah. it. If your rifle went down, here's one of ours. Use it. You need ammo, we got you covered. Because I wanted everyone at a match to have the success that I had. Um, not everybody had the backing of a big corporate entity or the sponsors that we had. And I didn't want them to come away from a match because their equipment didn't work or something broke or they yeah. lost something and feel, well, I didn't get a chance to compete. Um, that, that right there, that right there is really our industry in a nutshell. It's how it, how we, we hope for it to be and we envision it to be. And I think the fracture, the fracturing and difference of opinion and petty stuff, it's just, there's no place for it because that's a great example of what this industry is made of. Absolutely. And, and for me, it was, how can I give back? You know, this, I've been so blessed for this opportunity and I never took it for granted. I was just another yeah. guy out there and, yeah. and I always competed that way. And I always treated everyone on the range that way because that's how I wanted to be treated, you know, as yeah. in some people's minds, as you say, you know, I was, I was on a pedestal. I was the pro shooter, but to you me, never, you were never, I've, I've never known you not to be humble in my experience. Never. I Thank mean, you. and we've, I mean, look at all the years we've run into each other yeah. and I've never known you not to be a humble man and gracious and kind to everyone that you see and go out of your way. Whenever we're on a trade show, even if, you know, I walk by and you don't know that I see you, I see you reach your hand out and introduce yourself to someone and welcome them, you know, and I think that's a, we all need to be ambassadors of our industry. You know, we've got a lot of young people coming up. Thank goodness. You know, and I'm thrilled. We have a really strong interest from young people that are in the shooting sports as a hobby. And they, they want to know how to make this their career. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, we talk about that teamwork and some of the team that we had back at FN. You've already mentioned Mark, super teammate. You know, we were one and two in the championship that year. We have shared tons of great things. Taper Bright, you know, he was one of our yeah. sales guys behind the scenes. Right. You know, he's at Ruger now. Ernie Beckwith, you know, he was one of the, the road sales guys in training. And, you know, he's he's with Dead Air running that company right now. You think of the horsepower that we had as young corporate individuals as a team. Now we have some of the largest leaders in the industry. That's that, right. You know, that that's what that teamwork. And I think people try to get involved in something and think, I got this, this ownership, it's all me. And when you do that, it's it's kind of the story that I tell. It's like a lot of people like to climb that ladder. And if you stick the ladder in the ground really hard, it'll stand up straight. And you can climb to the top really fast. But that thing is going to get wobbly yeah. and sooner or later it's going to fall over. But if you take your time and build that pyramid and build a base and then another layer and then another layer, and you can stay at the top, but as you build that layer, you always have that system in place because you're not going to be at the top forever. Yeah. And when you're gone, you want to make sure that your base is solid and that team can continue on without you because yeah. that's the reality. It's going to happen someday. So no matter what position I'm in, I always want to make sure that I'm giving the next person the opportunity to follow in my footsteps. And my way is not the only way. It's just a way. Yeah. And I want to make sure I give that next person that opportunity. So when we talk about the youth, you know, some of the funnest times I had on the range were the, the youth classes that we did. You know, it's a three gun class was really, you know, my big thing because it was I was more of a three gun competitor than anything. So it was my opportunity to give back to the community and have the young shooters on the range. Some of the young shooters that we've had in the past now, there's two or three that are uh, working for different entities on Capitol Hill right now. There's wow. people in the military. There are people that are actually started getting their start in different companies in the industry. It was amazing to have that run. And the same thing for the youth. You know, I tell you that young people coming into the industry right now, you got to get, take a step back and understand what we talked about. It's, it's not a, what can the industry give me? Yeah. Right. It is. What can I give the industry? How can I build this to the next level? Because that's what our goal is, is to build this industry to the next level because that next generation is going to take our place. Yep. And I look back at some of the greats in the industry and think, you know, man, how can I fill Bill Ruger's spot? Right. The man was an icon. You know, that's that's yep. unbelievable. So I'm just a little piece of the puzzle. How can I grow my team to be that next team that really develops the next whiz bang 5000 that you know, produces the most of something, you know, how can I get my team to that spot? So, you know, coming in as a pro shooter, it was, how do I solve a problem? And that problem was just one stage at a time to complete, complete a complete match. Um, right. In my daily business, it's how do I solve the problem for whatever team is struggling today? And that's, right. uh, that's more of a, my, my corporate thing is I don't like to be a firefighter. Um, but sometimes you have to be, I'd yeah. rather build a sprinkler system and just let yeah. it constantly be out there taking care of the little fires. So they don't come a big fire that I have to put out with all means necessary. Well, let's talk about Asmuth technology. What okay. an amazing company. So you guys manufacture uh, parts for lots of different companies. Is that right? That's correct. So we are strictly a contract manufacturer. So the, the Asmuth brand, is uh, is a um, is just a company. We're a corporate entity that manufactures um, piece, pieces and parts for more than a hundred companies in the industry. Um, wow! And we are we are behind the scenes. We we help a lot of people get products off the ground. We help people get manufacturing volumes that they need. Uh, we make individual small components all the way through completed product for some companies. But we are you know kind of the Oz behind the curtain, if you will. Um, yeah. And, you know, this this part of my career is really amazing, Shailene, because as I've been in companies, so, you know, when I was at FN, I had a lot of friends in other companies and we couldn't mm -hmm. talk about certain things because I've got this new product that's coming to market. Well, I can't talk to my buddy at this company because they're working on something too. So we really right. were separated. When I was running Armalite, same thing. I'm developing new product. I want to get it to market. I can't really talk about what we're doing or what you're doing because eh, we're kind of competing, even though we're we're friends. Right. Business. Right. Now in this role, 
all of my friends are my customers. Yeah. Yeah. And they know that I make something for the other company, but they don't care because I'm making their product and I'm right. doing the best I can for them. So this, this role gives me the opportunity to work and help so many people in the industry. It really is like the perfect place for me because that's who I've been. That's who I've always yeah. wanted to be is how can I help someone else achieve their goals? So while I have goals as the CEO of the company, my greater goal is to help others. And now that's what I get to do on a daily basis. So you guys, I mean, the reputation is very good. And I know you've been working there for, are we almost to four, five years there too? We're four or four years in now. Yes. I don't know where time, fl time flies. <laughs> um, and I know, I, I know that a lot of the, um, the executives now that are your friends are using the services of Asmuth, which I'm thrilled about. Ta let's talk about the kind of people that you look to bring on to that team and the culture, because I love that you guys have been doing some video snippets on LinkedIn and some of your marketing to really show people these are real people that are here working. And I know you were in one of the first ones. So can you maybe talk about the culture of the company and the and the type of talent that you look to hire either currently or or even the type of skill sets you look for? Sure. So, you know, as a contract manufacturer, we have a broad base of talent, right? We have operators that have zero experience. And when we hire an operator for a CNC position, they, they don't have to have any experience. We train from the ground up. Our, our processes are broken down to the simplest form so that someone can start with zero experience. And within three to four months, they kind of have a good feel. Almost 80% of our new hires have never seen or heard of a CNC. They wouldn't wow. know it from, you know, a trash truck sitting out in the parking lot. Huh. So we, we have that opportunity here that we can hire from ground zero. And I have, you know, engineers from around the world, actually. So, you know, a lot of uh, people come from Southern Florida, Southwest Florida, from Cuba, from Venezuela, um, Nicaragua, uh, Cuba, you know, I mean, just all over the place. Yeah. And, you know, we have this big melting pot, you know, of uh, Laotian. And it, it's it's just amazing that we have a team that works together. So, you know, we treat it as a family and the company's 12 years old, uh, going on 13. Um, and I have probably 35 employees more than 10 years with the company. Wow. So, you know, the culture and the fit is that we all work together. So, you know, the executive team, uh, Lynn, who's our CEO, was co-founder of the company. Him and I are on the floor daily. You know, it's not a let's run out here and see what the problem is and we'll smash it till we fix it. Yeah. We walk the floor in the morning to see what's happening. We get a feel for what's happening to manufacturing and we know our people. So we might not know everybody by first name immediately, but I bet we know 90 percent, you know. Yeah. So we're yeah. constantly out on the floor to see how our people are doing because it's important to us because without the people, the machines won't do anything. So the machines yeah. will cut a piece of steel. They don't care what it is. Yeah. But the people make it work and we yeah. understand that. So we, we look at um, team fit and mm -hmm. culture, you know, our culture is family oriented, right? So we understand that people have uh, lives outside of work and uh, we try to make sure that we can uh, foster that environment here because family is important. And, um, you know, we're we're blessed to have the people that we have. Um, we have some of our employees that started as um, sweeping the floor, running the saw. Some of the simplest operations have worked up to be some of our head programmers, our lead That's engineer. All real, started career, real career progression and training people a skill they can take anywhere. You Absolutely. know, it'd be great if they retired there, but you're, you know, it's impossible to ask someone for that. And to be able to come into a company that's American manufacturing and learn how to do that, they can even learn the language and the culture, and that'll take them and their family on to the next place. So it's Absolutely. not just, it's not just executive level jobs. It's hands-on, on the floor, the wide range of positions. Yeah. I mean, we have, uh, we have a little 105,000 square feet of floor space, 265 CNCs, um, wow. We range from 230 to 280 employees, depending on where we are in the business. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Everything from, you know, 
maintenance crew uh, to the executive level, program managers, sales team, engineers, operations, uh, assembly. You know, it it is is such a broad um, mix of what we have, and you know, like you said, the language. Fifty percent of our staff aren't English speaking. Spanish is their number one language, and we have plenty of people that can translate. So the communication is great. Um, so, you know, we have, we don't have these barriers to entry that most companies have. Yeah. Because, uh, we, we are a contract manufacturer and we have broken our process of manufacturing down to the simplest form that we have that really basic entry level position, but we have a really good progression for anybody that wants to, or takes that initiative to go to the next level. Yeah, that's great. Well, it's exciting to hear about American manufacturing and the growth. And I know it's grown since you started, and I know it, it grew even before that to create your role. So congratulations to the founders and owners, because this is this is exciting and good stuff, and we want to see more of that. So if anyone's listening um, to this and you need contract manufacturing, you can reach out to Tommy Thacker on LinkedIn. And we will put a link to Azimuth on this podcast, wherever there's a connection or an opportunity to put it in the comments. And if you guys have a careers page, we'll put it that in there too. Are there any uh, any positions you're working on right now that you need some help and looking for good talent? You know, I think we're, uh, we have program management, which is uh, internal management between engineering, sales teams, production. Uh, so we're looking for some program management help right now. Good. Um, there might be, a, you know, assistant uh, engineering positions uh, coming open quickly um, to help uh, get some products to the to the next level. Um, Excellent. Yeah. So there's definitely definitely some opportunities. So if people are looking, uh, they should definitely reach out. Yes. Yeah, so listen up, people on this podcast. There's some open positions at this great company. So if you aren't sure if you'd qualify, you need to reach out anyway and find out what else they're looking for. This is a good company to join. Well, thank you, Tommy, very much. I appreciate your time and what a what a great opportunity to you and I, we could talk for like two yeah, hours. We're both exactly. <laughs> um, but thank you for this very much because I think it's important to set the example and that's where you're at. You're setting the bar for the for the other people that are coming in and, and you have a long way to go before you're going to be retired. So you keep doing that. And one last thing I did kind of want to mention, I know we're on our way out here, but that artwork behind you, um, <laughs> we talked a little bit about that. That is really, really, really special. Yes. This is uh, this is a Dick Kramer original. It is a uh, one of very few, uh, not many that are not in the tactical world. Um, so Dick was a longtime friend of mine um, from the Northern Virginia area, uh, him and Jenny. And, and a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to uh, to look at some of the things that he had available. And uh, I got this uh, zebra print that is it's unfinished work. Uh, the zebra is complete. You can see the outlines around it. But it's uh, it's an original that he didn't finish. And uh, it's a prized possession for me. Everybody knows Dick for his amazing tactical artwork for HK and Remington, all the other brands out there that yeah. he's done a lot of work for, Leupold, Zodiac. Um, but this is a uh, something that's totally different. It's, it's not uh, not a mainstream for uh, for Dick Kramer artwork. And uh, it's a cherished piece that, uh, like I say, I'll, I'll prize, be prized possession forever. Well, I think for me, you're a living example of why I joined this industry and why I appreciate it so much. Because it's hard to explain to people that this is really special. This is an industry that if you give to it, it gives you back tenfold. And if you're if you give to the industry, which is kind of what you started with talking about is if you want to be a part of this industry, give to it. It will give you back tenfold. And I, think, you know, it's just these people are all still all still friends. And even if they are competitors, it's a very unique industry. Exactly right. Well, that's a wrap for Headhunters Northwest Podcast. Thank you, Tommy Thacker. And until next time.